Hi everyone, my name is Paul Rösler and the paper that I present today is joint work together with Alexandra Beanstalk and Yevgeny Dodis. The title of our paper is on the price of concurrency in group ratcheting protocols. Before I turn to concurrency and I explain what the price in this setting means, I will first give you an idea of what group ratcheting is. Group ratcheting protocols have the following core functionality. They enable members of a group to jointly establish group keys. With these group keys, these users can then, for example, protect their conversations in group chats and instant messaging. As instant messaging is the core deployment scenario for group ratcheting protocols, we consider the following threat. Adversaries are able to expose the local secrets that users use to compute and establish their group keys. Thereby, these adversaries, of course, also obtain the group keys for a while until, for example, the, these group members can recover from these exposures. Exposures are uh, realistic mainly because, on the one hand, group chats and instant messaging often take a very long time, and on the other hand, users use their mobile devices for communicating in such chats. Thereby, the accessibility of these adversaries to these secrets is potentially increased. Now, these group members can recover from such exposures as soon as the adversary has no access to these secrets anymore uh, in the following way. These group members can sample new secrets and with these new secrets they can derive public values that they can then share in the group and as soon as every group member who has been exposed recovered via such a sharing of new public values, these group members should be able to compute a, group, a secure group key again. Now, as you can see here, if these users recover in a sequential schedule, this takes a very long time, potentially even uh, linear in the number of group members. On the one hand, it can be very real realistic in groups that if there is no scheduling uh, algorithm, uh, that these users uh, concurrently initiate their recovery. On the other hand, if they can do so, and if the protocol is uh, able to process such in, uh, simultaneously initiated recoveries, then also the time that is used for uh, effective recovery is significantly decreased. So we think that a main target of such group ratcheting protocols should be, on the one hand, reaching post-compromise security, meaning uh, reaching recovery from such exposures, and this very quickly, ideally, and also the shares that these users distribute in order to recover from uh, these exposures should be minimal in order to uh, keep the communication overhead small. And finally, as I already mentioned, it would be uh, helpful and desirable if these recovery can, recoveries can be handled concurrently. I already mentioned the problems if protocols do not achieve these goals. On the one hand, the recovery takes a very long time and on the other hand, if only recoveries in a sequential schedules, uh, a schedule can be processed, then this needs some kind of a coordination mechanism. And this often requires consensus protocols, which are either, uh, either inapplicable or very inefficient for decentralized networks. Okay, after sketching the ideas and goals of our work, I will next give you an idea of why previous protocols were not able to both achieve post-compromise security and do this for uh, concurrently initiated uh, recovery attempts. After giving you an idea or a, an overview of a previous work, I will look at, onto our lower bound uh, result. This result tells you that there is a minimal communication overhead that is necessary for users to concurrently recover from exposures. After uh, looking at this lower bound, I will introduce our construction of group ratcheting that achieves a communication overhead that is very close to our lower bound and thereby we provide an upper bound that is almost optimal. I will close the talk with questions that we leave open for future work. Okay, so let's look at what previous constructions for group ratcheting did. Their main approach bases on dynamic group key exchange protocols, which have a long history in the literature, mainly from the 80s to the early 2000s. The main idea behind this is that users who have been exposed can be considered as unwanted identities who are members of a group. So in order to recover, uh, I, for example, could be uh, an exposed user who, ha who has an unwanted identity. And what I would do is I would remove my previous or current identity and then after the adversary ends the access to my device, I would generate a fresh identity and add this identity to the group. 
It turns out that mainly tree-based dynamic group key exchange protocols fit well, especially for the settings in instant messaging where we have asynchronous communication and where we want to reduce uh, the communication overhead. So due to the tree-based structure, structure, we have essentially logarithmic overhead in the number of group members for recovering. And also what is very helpful is that these removes and uh, addings of users in these tree-based uh, protocols can be conducted non-interactively. So the main idea is that all the members of a group are structured and represented by the leaves in a tree. So all these users have secrets and public values and all the secrets and public values that these users have in their own leaf on the, and on the path to the common root are stored on the devices of each member. So the joint group key who is then stored in all uh, local states of the members can be considered and essentially is the joint group key. Now, uh, as you see here, as I mentioned, I store all the uh, secrets that are on the path from my own leaf to the root. The main contributions of early works on uh, group ratcheting are that they observed that this merging of adding and removing, or vice versa, adding of removing and adding, can be used to realize group ratcheting. Another main contribution is that these works, specifically by uh, Katik Bhagavan and Richard Barnes and Eric Riscola, observed that you can generalize the idea of uh, Diffie-Hellman trees to uh, key encapsulation mechanism trees. So abstractly uh, coming from this Diffie-Hellman specific way to the abstract public key encryption idea. Now I will give you an idea how these constructions work. If, for example, Charlie wants to recover from an exposure, Charlie simply samples a new value xc prime, and from this xc prime, Charlie generates a new key pair for key pair for the own leaf. Charlie then also uh, obtains and uh, deterministically derives a, another secret as a seed for the parent of this leaf uh, uh, node of Charlie. Then, from this uh, new seed xc prime d. Charlie generates a key pair for this parent node and Charlie continues to do this for all the remaining parents on the, root, uh, on the uh, path from the leaf to the root. In order to let the other users know the nodes on their own paths, Charlie will encrypt to the respective siblings on that path uh, on, to these respective public keys of these siblings. So essentially for letting uh, Dave know the common parent with Charlie, the seed that is then used for uh, on the one hand to uh, generate the new key pair of the parent of Charlie and Dave, but also to generate the, uh, the root key pair, Charlie simply encrypts this X C prime D to the public key of Dave. After uh, doing this recovery, all the secrets that Charlie previously knew uh, are now updated and thereby the adversary when only uh, exposing the secrets of Charlie does not have any or does not know any current secrets uh, in this tree anymore. There are, um, there are many more works that in, uh, enhanced these ideas of updating these secrets in these trees, for example increasing uh, or enhancing the forward secrecy guarantees or keeping a balanced tree structure or even providing security against active adversaries. The main problem of all these uh, ideas and strategies is that they do not achieve these goals that we are looking for, namely uh, concurrency for recovery. The main goal that I want, uh, or the main problem that I want to mention here is that if Charlie and Dave at the same time try to recover from exposures of their old secrets, they would encrypt these newly generated secrets to the public keys of an old state. So these public keys uh, remain to old secret keys and they, they, these users want to recover from these potentially old exposed secret keys. But the problem is that they don't know of um, new public keys of the respective partner yet. So what they would still do is they would encrypt the new secrets to the old secret keys and thereby they would not recover from these exposures effectively. So what you would essentially need uh, is potentially multi-party non-interactive key exchange for which we do not have any efficient constructions yet. Okay, so what you see here is that all of these protocols indeed achieve post-compromise security with a very little overhead, namely logarithmic in the number of group members, but they all do not really achieve concurrency. There are some uh, ways to uh, circumvent the problems of concurrency, 
but mostly all these uh, circumventions do not achieve either good uh, overhead, so uh, little overhead, or do not achieve post-compromise security. For example, the MLS draft, the current version, uh, version 9, achieves uh, concurrency and post-compromise security, but in this case it degrades uh, from a tree kind of to a linear structure and thereby a linear overhead and the number of group uh, members is achieved, which is not desirable. Similarly, another approach to handle concurrency is to keep a tree structure, but in this case post-compromise security, similar to the way that I just sketched, is uh, not achieved. Okay, there are uh, other uh, attempts and ways to achieve messaging and group ratcheting for the purpose of establishing a group conversations. A group conversation, for example, WhatsApp simply uses forward secure deterministic hash chains to update the secrets in a group and thereby they achieve a minimal overhead of only constant in the number of group members and they can also handle concurrency but what they cannot do is they cannot achieve post-compromise security. Uh, another approach is by Signal and this approach has uh, very recently been analyzed formally and this approach is simply using the pairwise channels between each pair of group members and thereby on the one hand, achieving post-compromise security as these pairwise channels are secure or post-compromise secure, and also achieving concurrency as these pairwise channels are independent of each other. But since every group message has then to be encrypted for n, uh, n uh, different pairwise channels, the overhead is of course linear, which we don't want to have. So the question that we ask in this work is, is there a better way to achieve both post-compromise security and concurrency with a significantly better overhead than linear in the number of group members. Okay, I will answer this question first with our minimal uh, lower bound uh, for the overhead. Okay, so for analyzing the communication overhead in our work, we introduce and develop a symbolic model. A symbolic model means that all the entities in this model use variables that are just abstract symbols. So these symbols do not have any bit representation nor uh, an algebraic structure. So what algorithms can do with these variables are following fixed transition rules. So in our model, we define these transition rules. Uh, transition rules, I will give you some examples in a second. And what we also model in our symbolic model is that um, group ratcheting protocols can only communicate in a round-based fashion. But within this round-based session, they can of course also be invoked uh, concurrently and thereby what we analyze essentially is concurrency in this round-based execution model. Okay, so uh, group ratcheting constructions can use the following fixed set of building blocks. By fixing the set of building blocks, we reduce uh, our consideration to the relevant building blocks and essentially exclude exotic building blocks such as multilinear maps, non uh, multi uh, multi party non interactive key exchange or obfuscation or something uh, similar, which is neither efficient nor really real realistic. So these building blocks are uh, dual pseudo random functions. So, for example, you can derive from random coins further random coins, or you can derive from symmetric key further symmetric keys. Uh, and we uh, consider key updatable public key encryption and broadcast encryption. So our modeling of uh, key updatable public key encryption is essentially as strong and thereby captures hierarchical identity based encryption. This is relevant as a very recent work on very strong uh, group ratcheting also uses uh, HIBE. We also show that key updatable public key encryption is necessary to realize two party, uh, two -party ratcheting in our work that I will present at uh, AsiaCrypt this year. So what you see here uh, are the different, uh, are the different um, uh, transition rules that we use. For example, uh, if you have a message and a public key, you can derive uh, a ciphertext from it. Or if you have a ciphertext with a fitting asymmetric key, then you can derive a message from it. Or if you have an asymmetric key, you can derive a fitting public key and you can update your public key to a new public key with key updatable public key encryption or a secret key to a new secret key. So this is the way uh, that these algorithms are restricted to compute only what we uh, provide them to be able to compute. There are many more uh, rules. You can see the full details in our paper. 
And, the, and what we want to emphasize here is that all these rules and thereby all these building blocks model everything that previous group ratcheting constructions already used. So we do not restrict uh, these constructions further than necessary and not even further uh, than what these uh, previous constructions essentially used. Our approach is partially inspired by the very interesting, from my perspective, very important work by Mich Michancho and Pandrani from Eurocrypt 2004, in which they prove a lower bound on the communication complexity for forward secure multicast encryption. And their result shows that if requiring forward security from something that is similar to dynamic group key exchange, it is required to send a logarithmic in the number of group members uh, symbols to the group. So potentially, since we consider post-compromise security and they consider forward secrecy, uh, our two results may additively uh, apply to group ratcheting. Okay, so let's look at uh, our proof idea. The proof idea starts as uh, with what I just mentioned. So group ratcheting protocols are restricted to only use the symbolic building blocks and only follow our transition rules. And these group ratcheting constructions are required to compute secure group keys whenever it is required by our definition. And I will give you an, over or an idea of this definition in a second. So first of all, Secure, sec, or group keys are secure by definition if they cannot be derived by adversaries who also only follow the transition rules in our symbolic model. And thereby this means that the adversary can only on the one hand use the symbols that this adversary obtains by exposing uh, the local secrets of users and thereby obtaining these secrets and computing and uh, deriving other values via transition rules. And also the adversary sees all the symbols uh, that are communicated via the public channel via which also the users recover. And the requirement is that as soon as every user who has been exposed uh, once shared new information and afterwards one further user uh, also shared some information, then uh, the next group key that is computed is required to be secure again. And in this case, the group ratcheting protocol has to compute such a key that is uh, not derivable via, via the transition rules that we define by an adversary. Okay, so these are the requirements and our proof statement is as follows. Uh, we prove that when establishing such secure group keys, under T concurrency, meaning that T users uh, or T members simultaneously try to recover from their exposures, then every message that these uh, recovering members send is at least uh, or contains at least T minus one symbols. So symbols in this case means uh, uh, distinct secrets or distinct public values that these users for recovering share. Then I will give you some further details on our proof idea. For the full details, again, uh, I refer you to our uh, full paper. So our proof uh, looks at three different rounds and these rounds begin with an exposure of group members. In this case, four members. So in this I, uh, round I minus one, these four members are exposed and you observe here that neither of these exposed members has any secure and underivable secrets in their state anymore. So the adversary can derive all the secrets that these users know. The second round is now um, um, or allows now these members who have previously been exposed to recover from this exposure. So what these users now do is, since they still do not have any secrets in their state, they sample and generate new secrets and from these secrets they can derive via the transition rules further values. Specifically, they can derive uh, new public values that they can, that they can then share in uh, the entire group. Essentially, what happens here is that all these four uh, users uh, generate and sample distinct own secret values and from these secret values they derive distinct own other uh, symbols. Specifically, they all um, derive and uh, share distinct public values. Observe, and I will mention this in a second again, that these public values cannot be uh, merged somehow. Even if we allow, would allow for non-interactive key exchange, then an outsider can, uh, even with non-interactive key exchange, not um, merge these public values. And this is a key observation here. 
Now, for recovering, as I mentioned, uh, in the final round, uh, the users who sent in this round I help these previous uh, users who want to recover to effectively recover uh, and then uh, all these users can compute a secure joint group key again. Now, in this uh, last round, what senders can do is they can respond to the public values that have previously been shared in this uh, round. And essentially, what a user has to do is sending to each public value that has been proposed in the previous round um, uh, individually. Now, as we may have multiple senders in this last round and they cannot coordinate because they are acting, acting simultaneously and essentially concurrently, each user who sends in round I has to send the same amount of information. Essentially, as we have two senders in this example here, each of these two senders has to send uh, potentially even four uh, values to the public uh, keys from the last round. This is a very, very high level uh, idea that I just sketched here for the full details that are potentially a little bit more complex. Please have a look into our paper. Now, what you see here is, of course, the sender, uh, if helping his, his, uh, himself uh, when recovering also in the last round. So if a sender sends both in rounds I minus one and I, the sender does not need to send to him or herself uh, in round I again, but to all remaining uh, members. And therefore, what we see here is that I mentioned it already. Uh, this user cannot merge these public values from the last round. But what I want to say, wanted to say is that every member has to send uh, T messages to uh, the T recoveries from the last round. And as we have potentially T concurrency, so in every step, um, in every round, T senders, we have T squared messages per round, which, ha which is an overhead of T per round per um, sender. Okay, so this is a very high level idea of our lower bound. Let's look now uh, onto our construction for the upper bound. Our construction bases on the idea uh, of having a tree-based uh, tree structure from the beginning of this talk that also other group ratcheting protocols use. Okay, so now let's look at these four users. What they do is, for example, if Charlie and Dave are exposed in this case, then of course their uh, paths uh, are uh, known, or all the secrets that are linked to the nodes on the path from the leaf to the root are known to the adversary. So these uh, two users would need to update uh, all the secrets on these paths. What these users, however, is effectively do is they only uh, update the leaves, their own leaves. So uh, in round I minus one, if they know they uh, have been exposed or if they uh, want to uh, recover in case they think they could have been exposed, is they simply generate a new key pair and this is everything they do in this round um, I minus one. Now in the final round, the senders, in this case, uh, Alice and Dave, first repeat the step that also happens in round I minus one, namely they generate new key pairs, but then they also help the senders from the previous round to update the nodes on their paths from the leaf to the root which is they generate key pairs for uh, the joint parent of Charlie and Dave and the joint group key. Now this works as follows. As I mentioned this already, uh, they sample uh, secret values xc prime d prime and they derive from these values both a secret key for uh, the parent of Charlie and Dave and from this value again uh, a, a seed value with which the root key pair is generated. Now, in order to distribute all relevant information, first of all, Charlie and Dave, uh, Alice and Dave, for sending this information to Charlie and Dave, they encrypt to the new public keys of the new key pairs from round I minus one of Charlie and Dave, this newly generated uh, seed X C prime D prime with which these both users can derive all the secrets on their path from their leaves to the root. This has uh, a, a size of t i minus one, which is in our example here too. Now, also all remaining users would need to know the secrets that they uh, would need to have in order to derive all the secrets and public values from their uh, siblings to the paths of the updated uh, path of Charlie and Dave. So in this case, the common parent of Alice and Bob 
would need to obtain the information necessary to obtain the uh, joint group key. And this can be reduced to degree one nodes in Steiner trees. So you can look at this uh, if you want to know the details in our paper. Essentially, uh, the overhead or the communication complexity that is induced for uh, encrypting information and distributing information to all siblings to the to the paths of the previously updating uh, uh, members from round i minus one is ti minus one uh, times log uh, of n over ti minus one. Okay, so summing these two results up uh, gives us the following communication complexity t plus t times log n over t for t concurrency. So uh, this uh, generalizes or becomes specifically uh, precise to the one concurrency case with uh, log uh, n and for the n concurrency case uh, that can also be handled by for example the signal approach that i mentioned at the beginning of this talk to o of n okay so again this has only been a very high level sketch of our idea please look for the full details into our paper now we can observe here now that after we uh, identify the problem that neither of previous protocols uh, both achieve post-compromise security, concurrency, and a small overhead. With our lower bound, we uh, see and prove that there is actually uh, a minimal communication complexity, namely for T concurrency, the overhead is T. And with our upper, upper bound, we uh, kind of confirm this lower bound, or at least uh, give uh, a matching upper bound, which is t times uh, 1 plus log n over t. So this uh, upper bound has only uh, a logarithmic uh, additional factor. So open questions that remain after our work is how to close the gap, uh, which is this uh, fa logarithmic factor between our upper bound and our lower bound. Also, we only consider a round-based execution schedule and therefore we do not really consider full asynchronicity, which future work can also solve. Another question that we do not entirely solve is which role non-interactive key exchange, so not, not multi-party non-interactive key exchange, but two-party non-interactive key exchange, plays in uh, this scenario. We assume that it doesn't really play a role and we give kind of arguments for this, but this keeps an open question for future work. Also, what one can consider is a delay for achieving post-compromise security, which can potentially reduce the necessary overhead. Also, we don't, do not consider forward secrecy in our lower bound, so potentially the lower bound is even higher if both forward secrecy and post-compromise security are required. And finally, of course, our results are applicable to the MLS uh, draft as we solve this uh, concurrency um, problem and issue uh, much more efficient than the current version, although of course our uh, current idea and our construction has some drawbacks compared uh, to the current idea of the MLS draft. Okay, so uh, the full details and the formal proofs uh, for our work are available of course on ePrint and you can always contact me via email or via Twitter. Thank you very much for your attention.